And if you'll turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, we're continuing with our discussions there, James chapter 1. Last week we talked about trying times, and I want us to talk tonight about finding help in the midst of our trying times. And what are we told in our world today? To follow the science. If you had a nickel for every time you heard that phrase or something like that, you'd probably be rich. What is the science that we're supposed to follow? What's the truth about COVID-19? Will the vaccines work? Is it safe? Well, just what are the essential services that we should be engaging in? Can we visit others? Does it make a difference if we're there or not, if we wear masks or we socially distance in these situations? What are we supposed to do? How do we conduct education? How does the government function? Medical services, elective procedures, all kinds of things that are going on. What about masks? Should I wear a mask? Do I need to wear a mask or should I not wear them? You know, even in here, in this congregation, there's issues over the use of mas- masks in our, our world and, and should it be that way? And we can draw lines on so many fronts. Our world and the, our states and, and, and country have drawn lines between all kinds of issues on many, many fronts. So many conflicting points of views on so many different things. How do you know which way to go? How do you know who to follow, whom to believe? Well, James begins his letters, as we've noted, with the subject of trials. All of us have faced, will face, are facing now many challenging and perplexing decisions in our lives. Some of you are thinking about college. Where do I go to college? Others, what career should I choose? Whom should I marry? Should I marry? If I should have a job, what job should I take? If I'm a parent, how should I educate my children? Should I have this surgery? Should I have this done? How will I endure the trials that I'm facing right now? Now, what's the obvious question when we're in a trial? After we finish that issue of why me, then the next real question is, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to handle it? How in the world am I going to get through what I'm dealing with right now? What should I do now? In order to answer these kind of questions and successfully navigate the troubled waters of this life, we need something to do that. James is going to give us the answer to that question in our text today. So we're going to turn to James and we're going to begin our reading again at verse 1 in chapter 1, reading through verse 8. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And now the part we're going to be focusing on this evening. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind." For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And we'll end our reading there. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Our Lord and our God, we do have difficulties. We face trials. We, We don't know what to do. And so, Lord, I pray that that you will give us some some things that we can do in our lives, some things that we can use as we look at the issues and the trials of our lives and how to move forward in them. 
I pray that your spirit would be upon us in this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so last time, last week that I was with you, we noted there were three reasons for trials in our lives. We said they were there to test the genuineness of our faith, produce endurance in the face of trials, and thirdly, to perfect us, to make us perfect, mature, complete, not lacking anything. Well, James knew that his readers were lacking something, which was preventing them from attaining that level of Christian maturity of completeness and perfection. And so what does he do? He focuses in on what was lacking by repeating the Greek verb here to lack in the verse which follows that statement in verse 4 about being perfect and complete and not lacking anything. So he begins in verse 5 here with this word, but if any of you lacks wisdom... James here is subtly telling us, and yet very clearly telling us, that you have a need. You have a lack of wisdom. And I think we don't really struggle too much with that. Some of us have egos, and maybe we, we think we're pretty smart, or maybe there's areas of our lives where we think we, we know it all. But James wants you to hear that, that you lack wisdom. James' message here is that, that you need something in your life in this area. And is it not just as relevant to us today as it was to the hearers when he first wrote these things? Like James, we are in desperate need of wisdom in the midst of our struggles and issues. What wisdom might we lack? What is it that we might need to be seeking wisdom for? At a very basic level, and, and this is pretty clear, we just need to know what we should be doing. We need to know what I should do now, what I should do next after this, and just that movement through our lives. Uh, wisdom we need to have is one that enables us to just understand the nature and the design and the tendency of our trials, to just understand what it is to be in a trial. And then to have the wisdom in the midst of that to perform our duty under those trials. Or the new, it may be what we need to do or, or things that will come upon us that are going to be new duties because of what happens to us in those trials. We, we may lack wisdom uh, for what God wants us to learn. There are things in our lives that will need to be learned by us, and trials help us to learn things. Uh, whether we like it or not, we should be learning things from God in the midst of our trials. For he always designs to teach us something valuable in the midst of these things. We also need to have a wisdom to find out what are our sins, what are the things that are, are idols in our lives, those things that we need to repent of, and things that need to be corrected in terms of our lifestyle and what we're doing. So we need a wisdom to learn how we can avoid certain things in our life in the future. These are the things we lack. And in the midst of these things, we face dangers. In the midst of our trials, during them and after them, there are things that we need to be aware of. What is it of going wrong again? Of falling back into the same sin, the same habit, and continuing in that, in that pattern of behavior. We need to learn the wisdom to not do that. We need to learn of the danger, and Paul talks about this in his letter to the Philippians, of complaining and grumbling against God and others. I'm sure nobody has done that in the last month, year. No complaining, no grumbling. We need to have a spirit of showing uh, a right attitude towards God. And, and what do we tend to do? Uh, I think you, you see this in your lives today. We have a spirit of rebellion. We have a lack of submission to the people who we need to have submission for. And yet we still have this heart that fights against these things. And we need to see the danger of losing the benefits that we can gain when we submit to our trials in a proper manner with all joy. We know what we can get. We've seen already what we can have in the midst of our trials. So many of us 
lack wisdom in so many of these ways. We're short-sighted. We have hearts that are prone to sin, and there are great and important issues of obedience and salvation where we need heavenly guidance. We cannot make it on our own. We need to have God's wisdom. And so James tells us, what are we to do if we lack wisdom? Well, look at verse 5. He tells us here very clearly. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. This asking for wisdom requires that you recognize that you need it. Now, I have a feeling some of you children don't always look for someone else's wisdom or wisdom in your lives. You pretty much know what you should be about or doing, and your parents might interfere with you and your wisdom. Uh, I'm sure that may have happened once or twice in your lives. But this says we need to recognize that we lack wisdom. And that's what, what James wants us to understand. There are those who do not recognize the need for wisdom. They're wise in their own conceits, in their own flesh. There's, there, there's just no need in their lives. They don't need to seek what other people say. There's a godly wisdom, though, we need to understand that can be ours only when we come to God recognizing our need for him and for his wisdom. That's what we need to see. That's what we need to understand. It's important to note that when James calls us to this asking for God's wisdom, he says it's not a once and done deal. You don't just ask once and get it and it's over with. The, the verb here translated for ask in the Greek is called a present imperative. Now, those of you who are good at grammar would know what that is, but the main idea is that this is a verb that means I ask now and I keep asking. Like, you know when you want something and you keep asking, maybe mom or dad for something over and over? That's the idea of this. It's a present and it's an imperative. I want it. We need to keep asking for it. This means that our asking for wisdom must become a regular part of our life as Christians. We have to make this part of what we do. We must ask God repeatedly for wisdom as we encounter new challenges and new trials in our lives. When we face dilemmas, when we lack wisdom, we need to ask God. And this asking needs to be specific for what you need. The very wisdom which is necessary for you in a very particular trial of your life. Now, it's one of our privileges as Christians, we can go to God and ask him for that kind of general wisdom that we need in life, and, and we should be doing that. I'm not saying don't do that. But whenever that particular emergency, that trial, that issue, that case of perplexity, that difficulty that you have, that, that you just don't know what to do, that dilemma, those are the things that you need to bring particularly to God. Tell him what the situation is. Make sure that you're voicing to God. Not that he doesn't know, but he wants us to ask in this way, to be very particular that, that we come to his throne of mercy and grace and we ask for wisdom for very items that we have in our life. Psalm 25, 9 says, He, God, guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. That's what we need to understand. If you don't ask, if you don't keep asking, then you're not going to have God's wisdom. And we need his wisdom. When an exasperated, stressed out person does something, and some of you know who we are, those people do unwise things, do they not? They make a rash decision. Someone who's overwhelmed with life and everything that's going on will not likely make good choices. If someone is upset and they're not thinking straight, they will do something foolish more often than not. And I'd say, you know who you are. I know I am. Every one of us would have to say that when, when there is a pressure, some discouragement, some disappointment, we need particular wisdom for that moment to deal with those issues. And we need to pray for that. We cannot get this wisdom by going to school. You know, I have a, a master's in counseling, but that's not going to give me God's wisdom. 
You may go and, and learn all kinds of things, but school's not going to do it. And just having some experience in life is not going to give you God's wisdom. We don't get it just by enduring our trials. It is from God, and that's what James wants us to hear. You need to ask God for this, and he will provide it. And unless we ask God for it, we should not expect to have this kind of wisdom. <clears throat> How does God give us? Well, he gives it, as we've kind of said here, when we ask. And that's what James is, is trying to get us to understand, to encourage us to feel this need of wisdom in our life and to go and ask it of God. Because no blessing is going to come if we don't ask for the blessing of wisdom. No man can feel that he has a right to the hope and the favors of God if he doesn't value it enough to ask God for it. No one ought to think they'll obtain this wisdom who doesn't ask God for it. So we should, we should know that God gives it to those who ask him. God also gives wisdom generously. He gives it generously. That's what he tells us. He gives it generously to all. It's not something that he withholds. God is not stingy. He even will give us more than we would ask and imagine if we will ask him for it. And that's what he tells us. Wisdom is so easy to acquire because the giver is incredibly generous. That's what we can know God will do. Third, we know that God gives this wisdom to us without finding fault. It says that he gives generously to all without reproach. Without reproach. What's this idea? Well, James says that God will answer that prayer and give the needed wisdom, but he says God will do it in a way that's very encouraging to me, that doesn't knock me down, that doesn't reproach me. He won't humiliate me in the process of meeting my needs of wisdom. He's not going to do this with a long lecture of how disappointed he is. I bet you've heard one of those lectures somewhere in your life about someone being very disappointed with you. Or they said, uh, you know, I told you so. I, I said this would happen if you went down that path. Well, God doesn't do that with us when we seek his wisdom. He's like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. The father who was looking for that son who had strayed, had gone off, and finally realizes, I need to go home. And his father did not give him a lecture when he came home. He didn't say, I told you so. What does he do? He opens his arm and gives him a kiss and not a scold. He puts his robe upon his shoulders and a ring on his finger and says, we need to have a party. This is how we need to look when we come to God, that he is going to treat us in this way. He will do this. So, so do you see the basis of assurance that God will answer your prayer for wisdom? from this verse this is what we would want to see and understand it's not based on your performance it's not based on how sorry you are for what you've done or how you've gotten into the situation you're in it's not based on what you've resolved and decided decided that you're going to do it's about God it's God's character and his love for you as his child and that's why you can count on it he will do this we are coming to this loving, willing Father and asking for his wisdom. And that's why we can expect Jeremiah 29, 12 and following says about this, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Luke will talk about this when he says about the father. The father is not going to give a stone to the son who asks for a piece of bread. He's not going to give a serpent when he asks for a fish. And does God not, if, if God is, is having fathers do this, can we expect less of God? Will he not give us what we need? He cares for the sparrows. He cares for these. Will he not care for us? and the things that we ask for. Now, it's possible that you might ask for things that are not what you need, and we might not get them, because they might not be good for us in our life. But there can be no doubt when we come to God with the right approach, asking for wisdom, and it's for our good, we shall 
get it. And that's what we need to understand. Well, James now turns the corner a little bit here on this issue of prayer. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. There's the picture. James says that's the way of the one who doubts. That's the one who who deals with these things differently. One day, this person may decide he trusts in God and he's going to follow him. The next day, this person decides, uh, no, I'm not going to follow God. I'm out with the wrong crowd and I'm going to do my own thing. And and then they they get tossed back and forth. And then he feels bad that he decided not to follow God. And, And so now he's coming back to God again. James says that this kind of activity will get you nowhere like that boat tossed about in the sea that never goes anywhere. Most of the people I know who have said, this Christianity thing just doesn't work, were doing exactly what James describes here. They would pray and trust God for a little while, but pretty soon then they're running their own life, doing their own thing, and then this goes back and forth, and finally that person says, yeah, this Christianity thing just doesn't work. But they're not following God's wisdom. They're not praying for wisdom with faith. They have doubts. And it was never designed to work this way, that you could, you could try it out for a while and then not do it for a while. We pretty much either have to get all the way in or get all the way out. There's, there's no middle ground. There's no fence that you can stand on. Decide to follow Jesus and trust him for whatever the direction the wind blows so that you might have him as your stable anchor. Elijah said it this way to the Israelites when they they were there deciding whether Baal is God or God is God. And he says to the people, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And what do the people said? Nothing. They didn't seek God's wisdom. They just said nothing. That gives us the picture of what what James tells us there in verse 7. Look at verse 7 and 8. For that man who doesn't do anything, doesn't make these decisions, does it by doubting. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Like the waves of the sea, the prayers of this double-minded man sway him endlessly back and forth between belief and unbelief, between faithfulness and unfaithfulness, between trustfulness and distrust. One commentator explains this this way. The doubter asks God for aid, but before he finishes his prayer, he thinks, well, this will never work. And so he vacillates, tossing from one idea to the next with no more stability of direction or purpose than that wind-whipped wave. The double-minded man's prayers are filled with endless agitation and instability. Why is this the case? Well, Jesus taught us very clearly why this is the case. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. James is telling us that we often lack wisdom because we're trying to serve two diametrically opposed masters in our life. And maybe I'm my own master and I try to serve myself, but I'm not going to serve God if I'm serving myself at the same time. And so we need to see the reason that this double-minded man lacks wisdom is that he fails to ask God with a committed and believing heart without doubts. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. There's no middle ground. There's no giving a little bit. It's all of it or none of it. James speaks of this later on in his letter here in in chapter 4. And he says this about those people. James chapter 4, 4, he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? 
Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's the picture of the double-minded man. According to James, God will not stand for any rivals. He can't have you kind of in and out, in and out. He will not grant the divine gift of wisdom to those who have divided loyalties, to those who are hanging out with the enemy in some fashion. Now, trust me, James is not demanding that our faith be perfect at this point in our lives, or that we must be completely, totally free from all doubts in order to receive wisdom. If that was true, none of us would be able to get it. But rather, what James is emphasizing is that we pray with confident, committed, and convinced hearts. That's what we need to be about. Here again, James is just really echoing his brother Jesus who said these same conditions, set these same conditions on prayer. Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, this is Jesus speaking, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And then in Matthew 21, he says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So the reason we lack wisdom is because we're double-minded in our lives, in our loyalties, and most of all, in our prayers. So let me ask you, do you seem like you're having troubles navigating the life that you have before you, the, the, the issues that are tossing you back and forth? Are you unable to apply God's word to the challenges and dilemmas in your life? Do you feel like your prayers for wisdom go unanswered? Well, if that's the case, then it's time to do some spiritual self-assessment here. Perhaps it's time that you ask yourself, am I serving two masters? Do I have one foot in church and, and do that kind of life when I'm there, and then I have another foot over here in the world when I'm in that place? Am I that kind of double-minded person? Do my prayers waver and fluctuate like the waves of the sea? Am I unstable in my life? Am I unstable in how I, I live my life for Christ? Joshua said this in Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, which meant those who were in Egypt when they were there, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living now. But as for me, he says, in my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua demanded that they make a decision regarding whom they would serve. Is it going to be God or the world? And Joshua left no doubt that he was that single-minded man when he declared, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What are you choosing? What's your statement? Have you made the choice? Who are you serving? Who owns your time, your talent, your treasure? Where do your loyalties truly lie? We cannot know God's peace and happiness if we're wavering back and forth like the waves of the sea, if that's the pattern of our life. We need to have a different view. If any of us lack wisdom, we need to pray and ask God for it, and he will give it to us. So coming to the conclusion of our time here in this section of James, why do we need wisdom? Well, wisdom has many functions in our lives, but as we recall, James begins his letter with those words, consider it all joy or count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. So James begins with this discussion of wisdom with the discussion of trials and the absolute necessity for wisdom in the face of those trials. So how exactly does wisdom help us through our trials? Well, it helps us by allowing us to see a bigger picture. It helps us to understand that God has a blueprint for our lives and it's in place. I like the illustration you've probably heard of that of a tapestry that wall hanging that's, that's sewn together. And I think we can compare God's work in constructing the plans of our lives to that of the weaver who creates that tapestry. 
From our perspective, we only see the underside of that tapestry. We only see that which is not pretty, that which looks like just a bunch of knots and you can't even tell what's there. It is when we cannot see the front side of the tapestry that wisdom becomes so valuable to us. Wisdom allows us to see from God's perspective. Wisdom allows us to see God's beautiful workmanship on the tapestry of our lives that in our trial place we just do not see. We need wisdom to help us make sense of the trials and the gritty realities of our lives day in and out. We need wisdom to thrive in the trenches of our trials. We need wisdom so that we can understand that big picture, but also that we might become skilled craftsmen ourselves in applying God's word to the real world in which we live. So as James wrote to his suffering congregation, he called them to consider their child's trials as pure joy. We talked about that. He knew that he was calling them to an incredibly difficult task. James knew that his flock needed more than just theological principles, platitudes to make sense of their trials. He knew that they needed wisdom from God. And I know today, sitting here in this place, some of you are having these struggles with trials today. You know what they are. You know what's facing you. Maybe you're on the brink of making a major life-altering decision. Perhaps you feel trapped by a heart-rending problem that you see no apparent good solution. Well, we need to understand biblical wisdom has the, the way that we can know in the midst of these things, even if we don't have the answer perfectly ourselves, God works all things for our good. God works all things together for our good. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. There's nothing in which Christians feel the need of heavenly wisdom more than in regard to the manner in which they should live under their trials. What should they do in the midst of these disappointments, perplexities, these losses, and these griefs that come to us. Do you not wonder, how do, I, how do I bear this? How do I get through this? Well, he instructs us, as we've said, to go to our generous Heavenly Father with that single-minded, devoted, and loyal heart and ask him for the precious gift of wisdom, knowing that now there is one greater than Solomon who has come. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. James is telling you and I that in the midst of our trials, that we must go to our king, King Jesus, and ask for that gift of wisdom. And he is a wise king, and he is a good king, and he loves you. And he will not only provide you with mercy and grace in your time of need, but he will give you the wisdom that you need in those times. Just ask. And he will give it generously, without reproach, to everyone who comes to him in that way. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we deal with difficult things. You know each one of us. You know the, the struggles, the trials, the things that we're facing. Whether we're older or younger, all of us have these things in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that we would truly come to you, that we would would come with a single-minded heart, not double-minded, not stray, straying to and fro, not being blown about by the wind, but that Jesus Christ would be the anchor of our lives in the midst of these winds that blow us back and forth, and that we would truly come and ask for that wisdom in the moment, in the very times that we're looking for it, that that kind of a prayer would become such a regular part of our life that we would pray for your wisdom in the midst of particular trials, even sometimes with small things. Even if we start with small things, that's a good place. And so, Lord, give us a heart that would desire to seek out you in those things. Help us to remember that one is greater than Solomon is here, that Jesus Christ is the all-wise one, that he is that king. He is the one who knows all. 
And so let us turn to him. Lord, if there are those here who do not know him as their king, who are double-minded, who are, are, are trying to have one foot here and one foot there, trying to live in both worlds, to come to realize that it cannot be that way. You can't expect, if you're living a life of double-mindedness, that you will have any of these promises come to you, that you should not expect that God will answer prayer. Lord, if there are those here today who are, are living in that world, may your spirit reach into their lives and show them the truth of who you are and what you call us to do and the promises and the blessings that come with turning to Jesus Christ, repenting of sins and trusting in him alone for salvation. And that we can ask for wisdom, and we need that wisdom. So, Lord, let us just ask you for it, knowing that you're a good God who gives us good things. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is greater than Solomon. Amen. Amen.